So this lecture is going to be on chapter 4, which is the study of chemical reactions. So in general, what we'll be learning about is uh, that an overall, overall reaction is a reactant's yielding products. And specifically, we'll focus on uh, understanding thermodynamics, which is the study of the energy changes that accompany chemical and physical transformations, as well as kinetics, the study of reaction rates. An important feature um, that we'll focus on here is the mechanism, um, the step-by-step -step description of how the reaction happens. And it's crucial that you guys understand mechanism from here on forth, especially with the reactions that we'll be discussing in the later chapters, including this chapter. So our first reaction that we'll be learning in this chapter is the chlorination of methane. Um, this methane will react with chlorine and in the presence of heat or light, so this is required for the reaction to occur, um, you generate chloromethane and hydrogen chloride. The most effective uh, wavelength for light is uh, blue, um, which is absorbed by chlorine gas, and many molecules of the products are formed from the absorption of only one photon of light. The free radical chain reaction involves three steps, initiation, propagation, and termination. Initiation generates a radical intermediate. Propagation, the intermediate reacts with a stable molecule to produce another reactive intermediate, as well as a product molecule. And then termination is a side reaction that destroys the reactive intermediate. So if we start to look at this in detail and look at the mechanism, the first step is taking chlorine. In the presence of, this, in this case, light, we generate two molecules of chlorine radicals. The chlorine radicals is uh, denoted by a single electron um, for each chlorine. Now, this splittage that happens of this diatomic chlorine is shown with half arrows. Um, that is uh, always shown for free radical reactions. And this half arrows indicate that you're homolytically splitting the chlorine atoms to form these free radicals. In terms of Lewis structures of free radicals, uh, chlorine you just saw on the previous slide. Here's bromine, hydroxide. This is methyl radical and this is ethyl radical. All of them have all of the electrons but have a radical in each case, right? A single electron. Uh, you can write this in um, without using Lewis structures, but showing the actual chlorine, uh, not chlorine, but the radical at each atom. So in the hydroxy, it's on the O, on the methyl, it's on the C, in the ethyl, it's on the CH2. Uh, free radicals are reactive species with odd numbers of electrons. Halogens have seven valence electrons, so one of them will be unpaired, which is the radical. We refer to halides as atoms, not radicals. So the second step is the propagation step. And propagation actually can be divided into two propagation steps, first and second. So in the first propagation step, you're taking methane and you're reacting with that chlorine radical um, or chlorine atom. The electron from that single uh, radical goes here. An electron from this bond, from the CH bond, goes to form a bond now with, with the chlorine. And then these leaves a radical on the methane to generate the methyl radical and hydrogen chlorine. The second propagation step involves the methyl radical that was generated and take, taking the chlorine molecule. And so this will uh, generate a bond with the chlorine, leaving a radical on this chlorine to generate chloromethane, the product, as well as a chlorine atom. Um, and so uh, these are the two propagation steps. And then when you take the two propagation steps together, you can generate the overall equation here. So the first propagation steps involves chlorine with methane to generate the methyl radical and hydrogen chloride. Next is the methyl radical with chlorine to generate chloromethane and the chlorine atom. So these then cancel out and these will cancel out so that you generate the overall reaction that we initially started with in this lecture. 
termination steps. A termination step is when you have any two free radicals joined together producing a non-radical compound. So an example of this will be the methyl radical with the chlorine radical forming that bond. Remember the half arrows to generate um, methyl chloride. So um, you can also have a combination of free radical with a contaminant or collision with a wall and that will also termination steps and so so some of these are examples of that. Uh, you can have the chlorine radicals alone come together to generate chlorine, um, the diatomic chlorine. You can have the two methyl radicals form a bond to form ethyl, ethane. This chlorine, uh, this uh, methyl radical can collide with the wall, just forming a bond with the wall, and chlorine radical can also collide with the wall to form a bond with the wall. So the initiation steps, uh, wh what's important to note is that the initiation steps essentially create new free radicals, and then propagation steps combine free radicals and a reactant to give a product and another free radical while the termination steps decrease the number of free radicals. So now um, in talking about equilibrium constants, um, equilibrium constants, which is called KEQ, um, is equal to the concentration of your products divided by the concentration of your reactants. So for that free radical chlorination reaction, the equilibrium constant is going to be equal to the concentration of chloromethane, hydrogen chloride divided by methane and chlorine. The number that comes out in the equilibrium constant is 1.1 times 10 to the 19th. This large value, 10 to the 19th, means that the reaction is going to go to completion. Free energy change. Um, free energy, delta G, or the change in free energy, is equal to the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. Essentially, it is the amount of energy available to do work. A reaction with a negative delta G is favorable and spontaneous. The equation here, delta G equals minus RT ln K equilibrium, K -EQ, or equilibrium, is what you've probably learned from general chemistry, where um, R is equal to 8.314 uh, joules per kelvin per mole, and T is the temperature in kelvins. And so you can put these in and you can uh, generate your delta G once you know the equilibrium constant. Uh, there are other factors that determine delta G or free energy change. One is the enthalpy change and the other is the entropy change. The enthalpy change is equal to the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants and the entropy change is equal to the entropy of products minus the entropy of reactants. Delta G is equal to this enthalpy minus T uh, times the entropy. And this is another equation which you, you have learned um, in your previous Gen Chem class. The enthalpy or the delta H is essentially the heat released or absorbed during a chemical reaction at standard conditions. You can have an exothermic uh, enthalpic uh, reaction in which the heat is released. When it's endothermic, which is positive, um, the heat is absorbed. Exothermic, um, it's negative. So reactions favor products with the lowest enthalpy or the strongest bond. In the case of entropy, entropy is, or delta S, the change in entropy, is the change in randomness, disorder, or freedom of movement. As you increase in heat, volume, or number of particles, that will increase the entropy as well. Spontaneous reactions maximize disorder and minimize enthalpy. And in this equation that we've discussed in the previous slides, uh, the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, this entropy value is often small. So if we have a problem where you're asked to calculate the value of the free energy change for chlorination of methane, here's your equation that you have to memorize. KQ for chlorination, we've already spoke about this, is uh, 1.1 times 10 to the 19th. So then you can put that in there. RT, R you know, is 8.314 joules per kelvin per mole. T, 
it's going to be room temperature, 25 degrees is room temperature, so that when you convert that into kelvins, it's 298. And when you plug all of that in, your delta G is going to be equal to minus 108.7. It has a large negative value, which means that it's going to go to completion, and it's favorable. Another important uh, thing to note are bond association enthalpies, or BDEs. BDEs, um, if they are positive, um, they require energy, uh, and so uh, that's bond dissociation. That means cleavage. We'll always have positive BDEs. Bond formation releases energy, so they'll have negative BDEs. So BDEs can be used to estimate the delta H for a reaction, and uh, specifically for free radical reactions. Uh, it's, it's usually the BDE of homolytic cleavage of bonds in a gaseous molecule. So what is a homolytic cleavage? As, you, as already stated earlier in this lecture, it's, it's when you have bond breaking where each atom gets one electron, so forming a radical. Heterolytic cleavage is when you have the electronegative atom getting both electrons. So if we look at homolytic and heterolytic cleavage, here is the um, example of homolytic cleavage. We're looking at A and B. But in the case of chlorination, again, you're having those half arrows in which you generate two radicals of chlorine. And your delta H is your bond associate dissociation enthalpy, so it's a positive number. Heterolytic cleavage is when, for example, you take a molecule where the electrons, now you see a full arrow. So both of the electrons will now go to the chlorine, giving this a negative charge and giving this a positive charge. And the delta H here will vary with the solvent. So bond dissociation energies, or BDEs, do not necessarily um, have any weight in heterolytic cleavage reactions. So if we look at the enthalpy changes in chlorination, uh, we can calculate the bonds broken, shown here. So the bonds broken are on the left side of the equation. They're going to be positively charged. So it's, and you look up the BDEs from a table in your book. So you see it's 242, 435, and when you add those up on this side, it's going to be plus 677. Now if we look here, these are the bonds being formed. Now because the bonds being formed, the charge on the delta H from the bond dissociation tables are going to be negative. So we look up HCl and CH3Cl and we get a total of minus 782. And then the, the overall um, change in enthalpy is going to be the um, addition of these two molecules, these two um, delta H values. And so the overall reaction is negative 105 kilojoules per mole, meaning it's highly exothermic. Kinetics. Kinetics is the study of reaction rates. The rate of the reaction is a measure of how the concentration of the products increases while the concentration of the starting material decreases. So a rate equation, also called the rate law, is essentially the relationship between the concentrations of the reactants and the observed reaction rate. And the rate law is often, or always, determined experimentally. So for a reaction, A plus B yields C plus D. The rate will be the rate constant, or Kr, times the concentration of the reactant A to the A order and reactant B to the B order. And the overall order is going to be A plus B, as shown here. The order is the number of molecules that the, react, uh, that the reactant, oh no, um, number of molecules of that reactant which is present in the rate determining step of the mechanism. The other part um, of reactions is the activation energy. The rate constant, which is that K sub R from the previous slide, depends on the conditions of reaction, especially the temperature, and it can be calculated by this equation, Kr equals Ae to the Ea divided by Rt. A is a constant or frequency factor. Ea is called the activation energy. 
R, as we already know, is the gas constant 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. So the Ea, or the activation energy, is the minimum kinetic energy needed to react. So if we look at the temperature dependence of the activation energy, at higher temperatures, the more molecules have the required energy to react. So if we look at a reaction at room temperature versus a reaction at higher temperatures, you can see that at higher temperatures, you're going to get um, more molecules uh, um, reacting um, versus at lower temperatures shown here. Another important uh, thing that you should know how to draw are reaction energy diagrams. So here's an example of an exothermic reaction in which you plot the reaction coordinate as a function of energy. Here are the reactants and here are the products. Reactants is higher in energy than the products. It requires an activation energy to get to the transition state, which, which should be denoted as a double dagger. The energy required to get to that transition state is your activation energy. And then it'll come down to the products. So the difference between the reactants and the product's energy state level is your delta H. And so you should be able to label and draw these types of energy diagrams, making sure you show double daggers, making sure you show the reactants and products, what's the energy going down for delta H, what's the activation energy, etc. So if we look at rates of multi-step reactions, the highest point um, in, our, in the energy diagrams are known to be transition states. Lowest points in an energy diagram are essentially intermediates. The reaction step with the highest activation energy will be the slowest, and that will be the rate limiting or rate determining step. If we look at the energy diagram for chlorination of methane, um, we're looking at uh, methane and chlorine radical going to methyl chloride and chlorine radical. And there's an intermediate here where you have chlorine radical being formed with chlorine gas and HCl being formed. And so here you're going to have uh, the first uh, meth methane and chlorine radical. This goes to an intermediate, which is slightly higher in energy. And then this goes to the product, which is lowest in energy. Now it has two humps shown here. Both of these are symbolized as transition states with a double dagger. Um, we see that this has the, high, has the largest hump from the starting point. So this is the activation energy for this. It's much higher than the activation energy from the intermediate to this point. As a result, this is going to be the rate limiting step. Then when you're calculating the overall delta H, you have to go from reactant to product. That reactant to product is the overall, but you can also calculate uh, the delta H from going from this to here, and that is positive as you can see, right? You're going higher in energy, so that's why it's positive and the arrow's going up. And then you can go from this intermediate to the product that's going down in energy and that's negative. So you should be able to not only label all of the activation energies as well as the delta H's and the intermediates, but also put in those values after you calculate the delta H's from bond dissociation energies as well. So the rate, the activation energy, and temperature, um, if we look at uh, uh, an halide radical uh, reacting with methane to generate uh, HX plus the methyl radical. You can see that fluorine, the activation energy is very little. Rate is really amazingly fast, and so this reacts really well. Chlorine, which we've talked about, reacts pretty well as well. And then bromine, you start to see that the reaction rates are not as great. Reac activation energy gets much higher as you go from bro bromine to even iodine. And again, your reaction rates become lower. And so in this case, reaction rate at 27 is indicating that no heat is required. It's almost at room temperature. And so for the cases of fluorine and chlorine, you can get free radical reactions 
um, with the absence of heating. However, in the case of bromine and iodine, you must heat, in the case of bromine and the case of iodine, even heating won't um, uh, accelerate the reaction much enough to see it. So conclusions is, with increasing activation uh, energy, uh, the rate decreases. With increasing temperature, the rate increases. Fluorine reacts explosively. Chlorine reacts at a moderate rate. Bromine must be heated to react, and iodine does not react detectably. So this ends this half, um, this, uh, half of the chapter, and we will resume later on.